Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to the 27th lecture of the course on sociological perspectives on modernity. We have till now, we have completed the six modules of this course, namely first thematic preliminaries, secondly sociological modernity, thirdly the structuralist interpretation, fourthly Western Marxism, fifthly synthesizing modernity and social theory and sixthly we have covered deconstruction of modernity. Now, we are in this we have now we will discuss the seventh and the last module. This is the last module of this course a new totality, how to forge a new totality okay? and in this module we will First, we will discuss a new totality, how to forge a new totality, not simply rejecting the critical modernist paradigm in sociology as feminism, cultural studies and postmodernism has have done, without rejecting the central pillars of modernity namely holism or totality, reflexivity, rationality and social movements, how we can redesign the discourses on modernity by keeping the concerns raised by feminists, scholars drawn from cultural studies and postmodernists. Responses that we get from critical modernist paradigm in sociology to the issues raised by feminists, scholars drawn from cultural studies, post structuralists and postmodernists. Okay. Let us first see. Feminist issues have made greater headway in the political practice of critical modernists than in their intellectual practice where they tend to be marginalized. This is related above all to the problems that feminism raises first for a holistic paradigm such as critical modernism which seeks to identify a coherent social whole, social totality and secondly for a paradigm which aims at a description of society in terms of op opposing social movements. Feminist arguments thus appear as either disintegrative of holism or cross cutting the lines of conflict traced between movements, between old social movements and new social movements. In other variants of critical modernist paradigm in sociology, a synthesis between critical modernist paradigm in sociology and feminist sociology has been assumed rather than worked for. In general, what synthesis there has been, what kind of the synthesis we arrive at, okay, there has been or, or what synthesis there has been is largely the work of socialist feminists rather than feminist socialists. So far as post structuralist and post modernist critics are concerned, they have been responded to rather more directly, but on the whole also more negatively. The compatibility of feminism and critical modernism is assumed in a fairly complacent way. The same is generally not true for post structuralism and post modernism in particular. There are two separate responses to these challenges. It is not like that only feminism, post structuralists, post modernists, they challenged the critical modernist paradigm in sociology. In turn, critical modernist critical the proponents of critical modernist paradigm in sociology they also responded to responded back to such challenges posed by feminism feminists and postmodernists there are two separate responses to such challenges the first is a response in terms of empirical sociology which offers in particular a rereading of some of the empirical issues raised in raised by 
in particular the postmodern critic, postmodernist critic and I will we'll, we'll try to relate to this encounter in this lecture and the second is primarily a theoretical response. Okay. One is empirical response and the second is the theoretical response which is directed more towards more at the post structuralist critic which is felt to be the more firmly grounded of the two and the one which is closer to critical modernism's own intellectual traditions and then we will see. Okay. And in some variants of cultural studies it has proved possible to integrate both feminist concerns and a number of the issues raised by post structuralists and post modernists in terms of a very loose coherence. We will return to this issue in the lectures to follow. Okay. What are the empirical responses to, to the post modernists? The empirical edge of the post modernist attack on critical modernist paradigm in sociology co consists effectively of identifying critical modernism with a series of empirical statements about the nature of contemporary society, showing that these statements are no longer tenable and arguing that this demonstrates the need for a theoretical move from critical modernism to postmodernism. And the critical modernist response accepts that empirical changes have happened, but argues that these do not form a fatal challenge to critical modernist paradigm in sociology. Instead, it is argued that these changes can best be understood in terms of general critical modernist theory. It is pointed out that the same theory can be used to support two different descriptions of two different empirical situations. In this way, to take an obvious example, okay, Marx's assumptions that the working class would inevitably develop a revolutionary consciousness was related to his assumption that it would get larger and larger and at the same time poorer and poorer, be forced together in factories and towns of ever larger size and pushed into uh, ever more bitter conflicts with the owners. I mean all cal class contradictions that we have already discussed in, in sociological modernism through the works of Marx and Weber. Okay. In this way, Marx assumes that rising levels of class struggle and increased interaction within the class would lead to the formation of a stronger and more radical class consciousness. And such argument makes a good deal of sense if the assumptions about empirical trends that it is based on are in fact correct. Nevertheless, in practice what we see that the industrial working class has generally failed to become a majority of the population. Today. Over time its living standards have risen neither the workplace nor population has behaved in quite the way Marx predicted. This is important. One critical modernist response to, to these points would be to point out that Marx's assumption that the working class would be overwhelmingly industrial and manual, uh, industrial and manual are not a necessary result of the central tenets of his theory of capitalism. For example, and to argue that a service proletariat is perfectly compatible with Marx's overall account, what is then required is either a reformulation of that theory or a periodization which count which accounts for the different situations prevailing in different periods. This is I think generally a legitimate strategy, but its implications are not always thought through. To be specific, many critical modernists still argue in terms of a necessary I mean structurally determined logic of development. This often amounts simply to hindsight where previously unexpected developments are subsequently explained away as part of a single historically inevitable development. More seriously as this example makes clear the kind of contingency that enters into class formation under conditions of desegregation and dispersal rather than ever increasing con concentration then need to be taken seriously. Nevertheless, the strategy is not in itself uh, illegitimate. It is very much legitimate, valid. What I want to outline in this lecture is that is what I think may be a coherent empirical account of a new totality 
emerging out of the writings of a number of authors within the critical modernist tradition, critical modernist trajectory. And this account brings a number of issues together. One, in terms of totality, this strategy identifies historical and geographical specificities within its overall account of modernity. Now, why we are trying to look at both historical as well as geographical specificities, I mean uh, within its overall account of modernity, what is, what constitutes modernity or being modern okay, may be different in the context of Europe, may be something else in the context of Latin America, may be different uh, in the context of North America may be different again in the context of Africa, may be different in the context of Asia. Even within Asia, what is modern, what constitutes modern may be different in the context of China, Japan, India um, and so on, Bhutan, Nepal, right? this is Pakistan, this, this is very different, right? Sri Lanka. And secondly, in terms of social movements, such strategy offers a link between the old social movements and new social movements rather than seeing, seeing them as in opposition. That what is so old social movement that we have discussed? I mean old social movements always are related to the movements carried out by the industrial working class, what Hamza Alavi and Theodore Sanin said uh, hypothetical proletariat okay. and the new social movements that we see in I mean the way it has been theorized upon in the 1970s since the 1970s and so on. The new social movements are, are carried out by the peasantry, by women, by environmental groups, by ecologists and so on. And there Hamza Alavi and Theodore Sanin, uh, they used this term uh, as against hypothetical proletariat, they said empirical peasantry. Okay. How to mediate the two? how to evolve, how to make a case, how to integrate both old social movements and new social movements. It is not the purpose of this, this course to, to or, or this perspective to look at old social movements and new social movements in opposition with each other. Rather, our purpose is to offer a link between old social movements and new social movements. That is why if we look at such strategy, then such strategy brings a number of issues in terms of totality, how it uh, the strategy must identify historical and geographical specificities with its overall account of modernity and in terms of social movements, uh, such strategy must offer a link between old social movements and new social movements rather than seeing them in as in opposition. Then in this context, okay, we must look at if we have to integrate critical modernist paradigm in sociology and the, the challenges or the, the constituents or if I have to say both, yeah, if we have to integrate the concerns raised by both opponents of critical modernist paradigm in sociology and the proponents of critical modernist paradigm in sociology, if, if we attempt to make such integration, okay, then we must try to evaluate such integration against the backdrop of those four critical pillars of modernity, namely holism or totality, reflexivity, rationality and social movements. I have already mentioned the idea of a periodization within modernity. One of the more promising accounts in this direction, periodization within modernity, when I say periodization within modernity, one of the more promising accounts in this direction comes from the German sociologist Klaus Hoff and following his statement, the British American team of Lass and Uri. In Lass and Uri, this is specified fairly loosely as a move from an early liberal capitalism to an organized capitalism, early liberal capitalism to late organized capitalism. 
within which capitalist monopolies, state involvement in economic activity and pressure from the working class combined to produce what we might describe as a national welfare capitalism. This is not less than we argue the epitome of modernity and modernism that it has often been taken to be rather it is simply a stage within modernity within capitalism and one whose own internal dynamic moves towards a period where capital is concentrated but production is dispersed both geographically and between subcontracting and subsidiary form forms where you will find its increasingly international articulation bursts the bounds of control or direction by the nation state and where precisely those conditions which Marx identified as necessary for working class organization. I mean what is that working class organization? What is that necessary for working class organization? I mean a strong and cohesive workplace and community base are eroded. This argument obviously parallels the opposition between Fordist methods of production and post Fordist methods of production. I mean that they are Fordist accounts of political economy and post Fordist accounts of political economy which we have already discussed in our module on in the post modernist I mean in my lectures on post modernist challenge to critical modernist paradigm in sociology. The potential advantage of Lass and Uri's uh, views are that it offers greater scope for uh, social agency which I will discuss a little while later and a rather better account of the geographical organization of late modernity that late organized capitalism. What is that late modernity or organized capitalism? As capital becomes increasingly international, transnational, Lass and Uri argue that it not only bursts the bounds of the nation state, but also disaggregates and dislocates its workers. There is a move from the kind of regional and urban specialization in given sectors, particularly of heavy industry which formed the backbone of the traditional workers movements to a situation where there are greater differences within regions than between them and where the older urban manual working class are dumped in management strategies which aim at a fresh start in terms of plant on greenfield sites and at relocating in areas where the workforce is neither so militant nor so easily organized as in the old industrial cities. It is at this point that I think that Lass and Uri's account intersects or can be made to do so with Wallerstein's account of capitalist world economy that I hope you remember this what we discussed in the context of capitalist world economy by Immanuel Wallerstein. You will remember that the dependency theory challenges the conventional account of modernization as a rising tide which lifts all boats sooner or later in terms of an account which sees the core countries of the north as exploiting and dominating the peripheral countries of the south in such a way as to produce a disaggregation of their economy. Where economic activity becomes oriented more towards separate developments in the core I mean developed countries than towards other forms of economic activity within the peripheral countries I mean underdeveloped countries ok. And the special metaphor here is quite useful. It examines for example, the, the activities of a multinational corporation MNC in a peripheral country as exploiting and disaggregating that country's economy for the sake of an accumulation of profit in the core. And this is very important in the context of, of a fusion of integration of the concerns raised by the proponents of deconstruction of modernity as well as the proponents of critical modernist paradigm in sociology. And such world systems account, I mean such the world systems account radicalizes this and does so precisely in terms of holism or totality. 
Firstly, there is no a priori reason to assume that a society has the same boundaries as a nation or a state. A priori means prior to experience, prior to empiricism. A posteriori means post experience, post empiricism. Okay? That is why, firstly, there is no a priori uh, reason to assume that a society has the same boundaries as a nation or a state, because a state has a defined boundary, nation has a defined boundary, but a society does not have that kind of boundary. Right? That is why we sociologists, we students of sociology, as a, as a student of sociology, we always try to move beyond any boundary. If we follow the language of political economy used by Immanuel Wallerstein, an alternative to assuming the national economy as a unit and then arguing that it is disaggregated. In other words, that its elements are primarily related to external rather than internal developments. It makes more sense to question this drawing of boundaries. The unit would not would then not be the national economy, but the world economy. Because of disaggregation of national economies, we tend to arrive at a world economy, in which what is primarily of interest are the economic relations which actually exist between two or more nation states and not those uh, which we might expect to exist within the boundaries of a single nation state. Putting it succinctly, capital is increasingly becoming concentrated at a world level at a global level and is thus becoming independent of purely national constraints. The international division of labor is becoming independent is not one between uh, I mean this this what is that international division of labor I mean uh, underdeveloped countries like India we, we provide cheap labor and developed countries like the countries of Europe, North America I mean United States of America they try to uh, provide capital okay that, that is the international division of labor okay is not one between whole uh, national units but if anything one between large scale corporate and financial corporate operations which link activities of production and distribution on a global scale okay and last and uri's observation that that differences between regions in the north declining and differences between them are increasing then makes rather more sense. In a country such as Ireland, which orthodoxy dependency theory is likely to classify as semi-peripheral effectively an admission of inability to explain its situation, we can then see on the one hand a managerial and political elite closely integrated with an Anglo-American come European elite of the same kind and on the other hand local populations such as the Dublin working class or the farmers of the west whose labor is no longer needed and who are therefore dumped. The midlands and the urban middle classes are then used as producers and consumers of a capitalist culture which is international not so much in terms of its content as in terms of the social relations that it involves our consumption of Australian soap opera, the, the global consumption of Irish music and so on. Less and Uri as describing disorganization experienced at national level, this relates to the reorganization at a world level described by Immanuel Wallerstein, albeit with different time frames for Lass and Uri, this process is happening now for Wallerstein, things have been like this since the 17th century or so. That is why periodization, three periods Wallerstein provided. We have already discussed this. Okay. And the implications of this are that we need to describe this capitalist world system, capitalist world economy okay, in Wallerstein's terminology as a society. In other words, as an interconnection of economic, political and cultural activity. Accounts which focus simply on the changing nature of western society are then inadequate, insufficient okay? and we need a theory of society which can manage not just to make the connection between poverty, exploitation and war in the third world and privilege in the first world, 
you know, but which can also identify the close interconnections between the third world elites and the ex colonial powers for example, and for, uh, for which the third world within the first world and in the ghettos of uh, North America for example, is not a marginal issue. What we can now identify as a precursor of this idea was developed by Antonio Gramsci okay, in his attempts to think about the creation of a unitary Italian state, a national culture and in particular about the economic relations between the developed countries and the, and the underdeveloped countries. It may also be worth pointing out that this approach has the great advantage of not marginalizing warfare, not welfare, warfare okay, and international relations more generally as external relations between two separate societies, nation states and modern warfare and then events within a single society. That is how perhaps this new totality that we are trying to forge, okay, this such alliance that we are going to make. Okay, may constitute uh, or may be holistic, may constitute totality. Then we will we'll also try to evaluate it in terms of suppose reflexivity and rationality together, obviously not really theorized within this account. You can always look at the lectures on Anthony Giddens and Jürgen Habermas on this score, on this on, on the reflections on, on uh, re reflexivity and, and uh, rationality uh, in terms of the perspective drawn from new totality. Okay. Now, let us discuss quickly social movements. I mean what are the arguments which are which can be posed as internal dynamics of capitalism, internal contradictions of capitalism. Okay. One may say that no, we have uh, moved, we have made a transition from working class pressure to welfare state, we have made a transition from uh, Fordist to post Fordist methods of production, we have made a transition from tailorization of capitalism to managerial revolution and so on. I mean, if you if you look at uh, the texts of uh, texts, I mean uh, these texts like uh, Daniel Bell's The Coming of Post Industrial Society, Manuel Kessel's works or Alvin Tuffler's uh, The Third Wave and so on. I mean network society, information society, um, post industrial society and so on. Okay. I mean these, these such, there is such transitions from industrial to post industrial society or the transition from Fordist methods of production to post Fordist methods of production. Okay. Uh, or, or the working class pressure to welfare state, okay, both involve increased organizations, growth of the new middle class of individuals selling labor power and knowledge, push for credentialization of all this. I mean, you can look at uh, the way Lass and Uri argues, Lass and Uri's arguments about the making of service class in this information society. This can then be thought of in terms of the development of a service class, okay. not people, but uh, not people in services or in terms of the increasing power of intellectuals. And post industrial society or, or information society has uh, brought about or has uh, been responsible for the emergence of this class called service class. Both state as well as capital increasingly organized by uh, directive or theoretical intellectuals with educational credentials. It can be thought of in terms of Foucaultian analysis of power and knowledge, that power is exercised everywhere, power can be found everywhere. Okay. For example, uh, Conrad and Zeleny, I mean in their work, uh, the intellectuals on the road to class power, uh, it is uh, I mean a very sim similar analysis that you will get. Uh, so far as Eastern Europe uh, in the development of state managerial class and party intelligence. I mean intelligence within a political party and you can make compatible analysis between Foucault on the one hand and Conrad and Jeleni on the other. Okay. And this becomes uh, disorganizing in many ways. It is notable effects such as capital becomes internationalized with at least relative autonomy of managerial class, 
there is increasing role of education and credentialized knowledge in social stratification and relations of power and there is increasing fragmentation of culture okay because there we don't see any any the culture we we see fragmented cultures i mean there is nothing called uh, uh, the culture there is nothing called cultural superiority or so okay each every culture is similar every culture is unique in its own okay that's what postmodern cultural uh, production uh, has taught us and there is a generation of new social movements that we have seen that I, as i have mentioned it uh, mentioned earlier that um, since the 1970s or so these these uh, uh, narratives about uh, workers movements that has uh, not simply included uh, uh, industrial working class but also peasantry women uh, environmental groups ecologists and so on. okay and all of these whether capital becomes internationalized with at least relative autonomy of managerial class or increasing role of education or credentialized knowledge in social stratification and power relations and and increasing fragmentation of culture i mean generation of new social movements all of these relate to increasing significance of intellectuals in gramsci's sense of theorizing and organizing activities that's why gram referred to the significance of the role of organic intellectuals in party building in carrying out a social and political revolution lass and hurry's account does not really theorize the division between capital and state service classes and simply treat new social movements as effect of rise of service class this runs into difficulty that their major enemy is typically managers and bureaucrats so that simple account of new social movements as social movement of service class gets us nowhere i mean what is the basis of new social movements here is has to be interrogated okay then what we generally find that as uh, roske uh, mentions that new so the, the base of new social movements is human services intelligence yeah. okay this is better in that it includes such as professionals as such as um, i mean uh, professionals such as journalists therapists and so on but it does not explain why for example doctors are massively underrepresented more Im importantly it is not clear why human services intelligence should form new social movements or why human services intelligence mm. should form the base foundation of new social movements advantages of such accounts include greater role of human agency okay there is an emphasis on unintended consequences of for example managerialism or or welfare state and so on and the role of the state and cultural capital or the role of knowledge becomes uh, central elements of discussion now if if we have to evaluate this account that there is continued difficulty over contingency or necessity and the difference or otherwise made by human agency uh, i mean there is a tendency uh, tendency for accounts to uh, fossilize into discussion of objectively uh, necessary developments in which human agency is merely a conveyor belt secondly for example feminism only appears in guise of new social movements and hence effectively subsumed under ecology peace movements and so on or peasantry clearly there is a relationship both with other new social movements and with for example the development of welfare state rise of female intelligence and so on but this account is not adequate uh, and has nothing to say about patriarchal organization of society that's why there is there is all the more an urgent need to make such integration possible otherwise it will be unsustainable it will be untenable okay we must make an attempt to integrate the concerns raised by the opponents of critical modernist paradigm in sociology okay on the one hand and the proponents of and the, and the concerns also raised by the proponents uh, of of uh, of critical modernist paradigm in sociology okay in this in this lecture 
what we have discussed we have we have tried to look at uh, how a new totality can be forged okay what are the responses uh, uh, or how the proponents of critical modernist paradigm in sociology responded to the concerns raised by feminists, uh, post structuralist, post modernists and scholars drawn from cultural studies, the empirical responses to the post modernists um, and also the theoretical basis that is why we, we discussed uh, Marx very, uh, very carefully, okay. Marx's account of the theory of capitalism and so on and then we tried to evaluate such new totality against the backdrop of those four critical pillars of modernity namely holism or totality, reflexivity, rationality and social movements. In the next lecture, we are going to discuss radicalized modernity and then we will discuss uh, Indian case okay? and then we will try to sum up. Now, we are left with three more lectures one will discuss radicalized modernity, then modernity in India, I mean India is reflections on modernity okay? and then we will try to sum up uh, the entire course through seven different modules. Okay? Thank you.